in the Dean's Lecture Series, special guest. He's been coming to Qatar for this is the third year, teaching here during the spring semester. The only Nobel laureate who actually is teaching at Qatar, not just giving a lecture in and out, but here in Qatar with his wife, Tonya. Between Kidman, a very proud Norwegian, you don't mind me saying that. He always reminds me that he's Norwegian, not American. Uh, went to Norwegian School of Business and then came to Carnegie Mellon for a PhD in uh, 1977. His advisor was Ed Prescott. And then joined the faculty at Carnegie Mellon University. He's been with us since then. But he's visited many places. One I should mention, Hoover Institute, which is kind of the mecca for for economists in the US. He's been doing work for Federal Reserve Banks in Cleveland, Dallas, one other place. And he is a fellow of the IC Squared at University of Texas uh, in Austin. When he got his PhD at Carnegie Mellon, he was awarded the <coughs> Alexander Henderson Award, which is a remarkable track record, actually, in terms of from the people who received it and success in life later on. Then in 2004, uh, Nobel Prize, he was recognized for contributions to dynamic microeconomics, specifically the time consistency of economic policy and the driving forces behind business cycles. Currently, uh, he holds the Richard P. Simmons Distinguished Professorship at Carnegie Mellon. He, of course, is a university professor. That's the highest position in faculty in the head at Carnegie Mellon. One very interesting note. When he was a student, uh, Richard M. Sire was the dean of, of the business school at Carnegie Mellon from 62 to 72. And then he became uh, the president of Carnegie Mellon for 18 years. Under Dick Snyder, the PhD program at economics, in economics at Carnegie Mellon, three students who overlapped in the PhD program ended up at Nobel Prize. There will never be another program or school which can actually claim that. It just won't happen, statistically impossible. But three of them who knew, you know, they get in line for cheap coffee and all that. PhD students ended up with, with Nobel Prizes. Remarkable success story of the business school at Carnegie Mellon. Finn, my old friend, today will talk about economic science and the aggregate economy. Thank you. Thanks again, Ilke and uh, everyone here for this opportunity to speak to you again uh, for the third year in a row. Um, so the previous two years, I talked about mostly about things going on in the world and uh, how I looked upon them and how I thought the economic policy would have had a good or bad influence on what happened. Um, well, not that much new has happened that would be interesting for an economist to talk about. So I'd, I thought I'd, I'd give a completely different talk today than I, uh, than I did the previous two years. Um, also, some of you would have heard before when I talked uh, in previous years. So, um, I decided to focus on the evolution or the uh, transformation of the field uh, of what sometimes is called macroeconomics at uh, 
CMU, we call it aggregate economics for reasons I will tell you. Um, <coughs> it, it, one reason it's fun to talk about is it all started at Carnegie Mellon, and so I'll, I'll tell you that. So the field of uh, macroeconomics used to be, uh, well, um, we all work with models um, of the economy, and uh, a, uh, a macroeconomic model used to consist of a system of equations. So there was a uh, consumption equation, uh, a investment, uh, I could call it consumption demand equation, investment demand equation, uh, labor supply equation, labor demand, and so on, money demand equation. And these, these equations had parameters. Uh, and and back, back then, uh, I would say between the 40s and the early 70s, um, in parallel, the field of statistics, or uh, uh, what uh, the practitioners used to call it econometrics, was developing. And uh, so people had great faith that these parameters of these uh, equations, the equations containing the factors that would be important for this, uh, for this uh, aggregate on the left-hand side, either consumption or investment and so on, uh, the parameters um, uh, suggesting how those factors would affect the, the variable on, on, the, on the left. Well, in, um, in the early 70s, a very important paper came about. It was by Bob Lucas, who later went on to uh, get the Nobel Prize. Uh, he wrote a paper called Economic, Econometric Policy Evaluation, a critique. Uh, I first saw the paper in 1973, but it was published in 1976. And it completely knocked the feet underneath the previous framework. Uh, Bob showed in uh, three very vivid, vivid examples why the parameters of these equations could not be expected to be invariant to policy changes. And if you could, couldn't use the framework for policy evaluation, that uh, removed a, a large part of its usefulness. Uh, <coughs> so um, um, when uh, Prescott and I got started uh, on our work, we, we decided to take a completely different approach. Um, the approach that actually was natural for us, um, I had learned macroeconomics aggregate economics as a, a PhD student, uh, in part from Bob Lucas. So Bob Lucas uh, gave basically the only uh, macro course that I took. It was called Growth and Fluctuations. And in, uh, I took it in the uh, spring of my first year, and it was like no other course, I think, in the whole world. Uh, that would go under that title. So Bob Lucas would start off with uh, kuhn tucker conditions, functional equations, basically a month of uh, very heavy mathematical machinery, but all focusing on the idea that what was interesting about macroeconomics is all dynamic. It's forward-looking, so we need tools to, to study how a, a dynamic system works. And then eventually he got uh, going on, uh, on economic examples. Um, I, I remember especially one, he, um, he came in, I know this because I kept the notes, and I still have the notes from the, this course. He came in uh, to class, uh, an, an hour and 20 minute class. He started putting assumptions and equations on the board. Um, and, uh, and then the class was over. Um, 
in between, that happened to be spring break. So then uh, two weeks elapsed before he came back. Then next class, he comes back and he says, scrap everything I told you last time. It didn't work out. Uh, and then he starts over again, makes some simplifying assumptions, and then he, then he gets going again. That paper, that turned out to be a paper, eventually, um, called Neutrality of Money, uh, and it became maybe his most famous paper, in addition to the one I already mentioned. So that, that was tremendous being able to see a master in action. He, he, taught, uh, he taught what he was working on, and we as PhD students got to, to, uh, to observe that. But the other thing was, uh, we, as, as students at Carnegie Mellon, we never looked at the system of equation system. So uh, I suppose that's why both Prescott and I had kind of fresh minds about how we would model the economy. A a and so we decided to be explicit about the dynamic decision problems faced by the actors in the economy, by households, by businesses. Uh, so we, be we built models containing millions of people, uh, thousands of businesses, uh, depending on the question addressed, we could have the government included, there could be a foreign sector, but explicit uh, decision problems where we assume that um, decisions were taken by optimization. Um, uh, we were explicit about the technology in the economy, etc. Uh, then um, we uh, found a way by which we could calibrate these economies, um, to calibrate a, a model economy means, or is something that's necessary in order to make the answer it gives reliable. So it's like, uh, one, one comparison is with a thermometer. If you, if you just put the mercury in a, in a, in a little, uh, tube and then you take it outside, well, uh, where the mercury ends up is not going to tell you much, but if you, if you calibrate it, uh, let's say you stick it in a, in a pot with uh, water and, uh, and ice floating and, and then you see where it ends up, you mark up zero, and then you stick it in a, in a pot with boiling water and you see, well, there you mark off 100, you use a little theory that says mercury expands uh, approximately proportionally with the temperature, and then, then you have the thermometer calibrated. In the same way, for, a, for example, for a business cycle model, it, it turns out there are some features of the data about which we have a great deal of confidence. Uh, many observations about long run of economies, and then uh, you work backwards from those observations to uh, what the parameters m must be in order to be consistent with that, and there you have the economy calibrated. And then, uh, then uh, the, these are complicated dynamic models. Uh, so one way to make them useful is you take the computer to, to use. You, you create artificial time pass from this model economy, and then you compare with the uh, uh, analogous time pass of the actual economy, and then uh, and that's what you can learn from. Um, so let me just give you a little example of, uh, the, the simplest example I can give you of such a model. Um, okay. Uh, so let me, th this uh, little model has a household sector and a business sector. Uh, the household sector is characterized by individuals who maximize utility. I, I have uh, written down a uh, common 
uh, utility function. Uh, we maximize the expected value of discounted current and future utility. Um, the uh, subject to a budget constraint. Now, this I should say that this this is uh, this is the problem. This is the stand-in uh, household's problem that so, that one can show computes the equilibrium of an economy with millions of people like this and, and thousands of businesses. Uh, so it, it can be boiled down to this to this little uh, page um, here e because uh, uh, this uh, is a stochastic economy uh, beta is a discount factor he, we know that people are, are uh, somewhat impatient this beta can be calibrated by looking at long run real interest rates what what, uh, because the, in the long run, beta implies what the long run real interest rate will be. Consumption and leisure are part of the utility function. And then we have two parameters. Uh, two more parameters, this alpha and the sigma. Now the alpha can be calibrated if we have data for, let's say, thousands of people that suggest how much of their um, relevant time they devote to market activity, how much they devote to uh, working, and how much they devote to uh, non-work uh, activities. So that, that's something one can uh, potentially calibrate to uh, many decimals, if you want. Sigma is a, can be called the risk aversion parameter, and that's that's not so easy to calibrate to anything, but it's, it, it's a parameter by which finance people know a lot. So, so, and it turns out for most questions it, within the reasonable range, it, it doesn't affect the answer that much. So the, the constraint from the point of view of the, uh, of the sum of all the households and the, um, and the, uh, uh, in this economy, I, I pick one where, for now, I, I'll assume there's no government and there's no foreign sector, so it's to make it as simple as possible. So that means that uh, this thing, which is central to all our macroeconomic models, the production function, uh, it gives us this economy's GDP, uh, gross domestic product, which can be allocated either to consumption goods or investment goods. So out of, out of the uh, uh, thousands of businesses come, uh, come uh, uh, products produced by the interaction of capital, factories, machines, etc., labor input, and then we have a, an extremely important factor called the technology level which uh, comes about through innovative activity, development of new, new products, new processes for making things, and so on. Uh, the key factor that actually is the driving force of, of long-run economic growth. <coughs> so this, this is from the product side. From the income side, uh, gross, gross domestic product must be equal to gross domestic income, and income the two main uh, forms of income are capital income and labor income. Labor income here, let's say a real wage rate multiplied by, by the labor input. Uh, here's a constraint on the, oh, and so this theta, another parameter of the uh, production function. Um, well, if we have data for decades about What's the average share of capital and labor income in, uh, in the actual economy? Um, in this economy, uh, theta equals the share of uh, the long run share of uh, capital income in, G in uh, gross national income, 
uh, one minus theta to the share of, of, of a labor income. That's something that's easy to look up in, in, uh, in data. Uh, over, over the past decades. Uh, then there's a constraint that says uh, leisure plus uh, time for work must equal the total amount of time available, which uh, without loss of genera generality, one can normalize that so that equals one. Uh, and I already said the long run values, the average values of these, uh, are instrumental in calibrating the alpha. And then we have the uh, two laws of motion, two equations that uh, make this economy inherently dynamic. Uh, it, it says that next period capital stock equals the capital stock beginning, beginning of this period that did not depreciate over the period plus new investment, new uh, new factories, new machines, new office buildings that have been uh, uh, purchased over the, over the period. And finally, so uh, to make this a, a business cycle model, we need an impulse. Uh, there's something that gets things going, something that makes the e economy actually uh, fluctuate over time. And um, I suppose that was one novelty about what Prescott and I did. We, we looked to the technology level as the source of, of, uh, of, uh, of fluctuations. Something that was not common at the time, technology level was regarded as all important for the, uh, for the long run growth of economies. Economies with uh, uh, acceptable growth of technology levels, they would do well, th those without not so well. Uh, so now this, you may wonder what, how we could we possibly get uh, calibrate uh, this or uh, get an idea of uh, parameter values for, for such a law of motion because technology level is not so easy. That there's no variable we can point to that says that's that's the technology level. That's but uh, a uh, former. A, a, uh, one of the uh, things for which uh, another Nobel laureate is famous, Bob Solow, is he came up with a solo residual. So the idea was, okay, in, in this production function, uh, we, this is GDP, which we, for which we have data, capital and uh, labor inputs, we, we, we can measure. The theta we can calibrate the way I described. So that means the only thing we can measure directly is the z. And, uh, but if we know all the others, we can infer the z and then uh, and create time series for the z, study that, that time series um, statistically, and then come up with uh, this parameter values, value that says, what the persistence of the Z is. If there is a shock to the technology level, um, does, it, uh, does that uh, tend to stay around for a long time or does it disappear um, very quickly? It turns out uh, statistically it stays around for quite a while. And so uh, in the quarterly model, for example, this road uh, turns out to be some, uh, some number like 0.95. Uh, then, then this describes the, the shocks. So that's, that's, that's a very simple model economy. Now, you can, uh, you can add all kinds of bells and whistles to it. Uh, you could even uh, include the government. You could throw in um, uh, government purchases as something from which people derive utility. You could uh, include a way to, to pay for government expenditures. Uh, a natural place to start would be to impose a tax rate on capital income, a tax rate on labor income. And then uh, th there you have the government included. Uh, now, um, 
So uh, the first question to which Prescott and I put it to use, this, this framework, was at the, the following. Suppose shocks to the technology level were the only source of fluctuation. Suppose there were no other source of fluctuation. There are other sources you can think of. You can think of uh, sources coming from policy, for example, or from abroad. Or suppose this were the only source. How much of the business cycle would still have remained? And, and the model gave an answer. The model gave an answer that uh, of around anywhere between one half to two thirds of post war business cycle. Uh, over time, as models got refined, the answer got refined and, and it, it, it kind of settled around two thirds. So, so that's, that's a pre pretty good chunk of business cycle. And that would mean that for many questions you want to address, um, even though it's really directed at something else, it's hard to avoid including this feature of, uh, of, uh, of the stochastic technology level. Uh, in, in fact, the, uh, the, this, uh, this approach to macroeconomic or aggregate economic uh, modeling for that reason has been uh, uh, by many ma named real business cycles. Business cycles driven by real shocks Unlike, unlike what people used to think back then, that monetary shocks had to be the most important. Now, what, one thing I'd like to point out before I leave this, uh, this uh, slide. Um, so, so uh, suppose we put the government into this framework. One thing about about the decisions made in this economy, a as in the actual economy, the, these two variables, the capital stock and the technology level, they're all important. Um, the technology level at any point in time comes about because of all these innovative activities taking place in, uh, in thousands of businesses. Um, but th these are very forward-looking decisions, decisions that carry with them a lot of, a lot of uncertainty. Um, they are costly at the time when they take place, as is capital accumulation. You build a new factory, it may cost uh, millions and millions of dollars. Uh, it takes a year or more to build it. No, no income coming from it. All the return comes over the next maybe 20 years in the future. So that decision, it's got to be that the businesses think, well, it's still worth it because the present value of, of the future returns more than make up for that large cost of the, uh, of the factor. But then uh, once, once you uh, put the government into the picture, then you realize, for example, suppose you put an income tax on uh, a capital income tax here and a labor income tax here. Well, the capital income tax certainly affects the calculations of what the future returns will be from, from this capital. Uh, and. Uh, so to make informed decisions about that, one needs some assessment about what future policy is going to be. Um, if that assessment is very uncertain, and I've argued, I suppose uh, one message of my talk last year was, uh, these days, that kind of assessment about future policy environment is very uncertain. In fact. I would say with certainty that the policy environment we've seen in re recent years is more uncertain than for decades. Um, so now, there, there is an issue that contributes, contributes to making, to making uh, 
policy, future policy assessment uncertain. And that is, it turns out, suppose, suppose the government is benevolent. Um, they, um, they, want to, uh, they want to make utility of people, its uh, utility of its citizens, as high as possible. Uh, so in this context, if you introduce the government here in this, in this picture, what would be a reasonable objective for the government? Well, a reasonable objective would be to uh, maximize utility of the typical citizen. Uh, so the same, same uh, kind of objective. Well, one thing that, uh, and maybe the, the most uh, astounding thing Prescott and I discovered was, well, that's, that's all well and good, but the resulting policy is not consistent over time. Uh, there will always be an incentive for politicians to change their uh, mind in, sometime in the future. Uh, a policy has to be uh, a, a plan that says not just what you're going to do this year, but, but how does it fit into um, the long-run picture? One of the uh, examples of uh, Lucas, for example, was uh, he pointed out that in the system of equation appro approach, the consumption function had some coefficient on income. You can't keep that coefficient fixed uh, in, uh, in reality. The, uh, some income increases are temporary, rather temporary. Some are fairly permanent. Economic theory tells us the response in terms of household consumption is very different depending on they, whether they think the, the uh, income increase is temporary or permanent. And so there's really no way out of it than simply to, uh, to, to, to consider policy rules in which you're also explicit about what's going to happen beyond the year you're looking at. But if you do, uh, then... Uh, uh, you state such a policy rule, say the one that maximizes utility for the citizens, you start implementing it. Clearly, future taxes will affect how much capital accumulation, how much in innovative activity will be done today. Uh, in fact, the entire expected future path will affect uh, that, that path. Uh, of Kaplan and innovative activity. When, when that future comes, then those decisions, the intervening decisions have already been made. And so the remainder of that uh, policy time path, which initially the optimal one had included the effect took into account the effect it had on earlier decisions. Now those decisions are made, and, uh, and there will be a temptation for the government to change its plan. And, and the way that will manifest is, uh, itself in, in practice is uh, more attention to the short run, less attention to the long run, especially in, in uh, if the government thinks the its budget is in an emergency situation. Um, and that's something that I think we've seen quite a bit of lately. Um, it suggests that it'd be nice to have a way to commit the government to a reasonable long run plan. But such a commitment is very difficult to come up with. Uh, the best success we've had, uh, I suppose, is realizing that uh, monetary policy is more benign if run by an independent uh, uh, organization. And it turns out to be the case in countries where uh, 
where the uh, central bank is more independent, monetary policy it works better than in, uh, in countries where, it, where, um, where monetary policy is basically controlled by the central uh, administration. An independent central bank is meant to be isolated from political pressure that may, may be around in it at any point in time. Um, so, so this this is uh, a, a description of of this kind of a framework. Now, one thing I didn't mention is, and you may uh, wonder, uh, there are some strange assumptions here. I seem to be assuming that people live are uh, immortal. Uh, the uh, utility function covers an infinite uh, number of periods. How about the fact that people are different? This is, I see only one type of person. Well, those are good questions. Um, and uh, that, that kind of assumption was something one was forced to make initially because of uh, difficulty with, I mean, doing something else would require more computer power than than uh, was available uh, for uh, for the kind for the kind of question Prescott and I studied the the business cycle question. It was shown later on that whether you assume that people are immortal and everyone is alike makes very little difference to the answer to the to the business cycle question. I. Um, I posed, but over time, of course, this framework was extended so as to allow for uh, consideration of cases where it's important to take into account, for example, where people are in their life cycle. Um, this this picture gives an idea about the import importance of that. It says. Depending on uh, your age, the age of the average worker, uh, what's your real wage? And it turns out, on the average, um, this is this is normalized so that the average is one. Uh, when you're uh, around 50, you earn um, uh, twice as much as as you do when uh, uh, when you enter the workforce. So that's an example of, of the what could be important uh, about the the life cycle of of the models people. Here's another interesting picture. It it um, shows the age distribution of the population uh, in 1994 and in 2020. Uh, and, and what this, this these are the num the number of well, the percent of people in each age group. So one, around 1.4% 1 between 0 and 1. Or, you know. what, what's striking is this bulge. And here's an, that bulge will continue over time. By 2020, the peak of that bulge will be, people will be 60 years old. Uh, when they retire, that would that would rep will represent a tremendous uh, strain on the gov on any government's budget constraint. Uh, so, how, um, what can we say about the pension system I in the face of this potential problem? That could even be uh, this, this could be such a burden that the entire uh, government budget constraint could be strained. In the uh, late 90s, uh, there were people who were experts at thinking about uh, future implications of something like that for, for the government budget. And they pointed out when, when they retire, the budget, uh, government budget under current taxation would be unsustainable. And they uh, predicted that tax rates would go up by on the order of maybe 5%, 5 percentage points. Uh, one of uh, one thing I should say is uh, keeping in mind the uh, sub theme of 
Carnegie Mellon. Uh, is, so this, this ability that later on developed to calculate outcomes for economies where people were ver are very different. It could be at different stages of the life cycle, or they could be inherently different. Um, that's something that really took off in the early 90s. And one of the key guys, maybe the key guy, was at Carnegie Mellon, Victor Rios Rule. Uh, and uh, he, he was hired at Carnegie Mellon uh, in his first job in uh, 1990, I believe. Uh, and, and I remember his, his workstation, just to calculate the outcome of one experiment, one computational experiment, uh, as I call it, um, could take 24 hours. Uh, by that time, of course, in 1990, computers were way more powerful than uh, when Prescott and I got started. A and that's a development that has continued, continued on and on. We can now deal with... Uh, Lots of um, heterogeneity across people. Uh, we can we can even deal with issues having to do with the organization of the household of, of the of the typical actors in, in the model. Uh, but what I was able to uh, what I was going to say in response to to these dire predictions by these intergenerational uh, accounting experts. Uh, it led to a, a very interesting paper by one of uh, the students of uh, Victor Rios and, and me, uh, Cheto Storsleffen, who, uh, who realized that immigrants typically are very young. I mean, th this is the same age distribution we looked at, except now grouped in five and five, five and five years. So it looks smoother, uh, but it has the same bulge. Uh, Immigrants in the past have, have been uh, much younger than, uh, than the, on the average than na natives. And so uh, Chetan, the, the question he asked was, suppose, well, to, we've heard these predictions about the need for tax increases to, to ma maintain the sustainability of the government budget constraint. Suppose we uh, instead ask by what percentage point would we need to increase the flow of immigrants to avoid that tax in increase? Uh, well, uh, he, his model came up with an answer. Um, a uh, more favorable answer, especially if one could, could be somewhat uh, selective in which immigrants to, uh, to consider. So he came up with the optimal age of, of, uh, of immigrants, uh, but, but all within a model framework such as, as uh, by then had become possible to, uh, to calculate. His paper got published in the JPE, Journal of Political Economy, in 2000. So that gives you a sense of uh, what years we're, we're talking about. I would like to to give you a, end with a couple of examples of what I regard as successful use of this kind of uh, general framework. The, the first is um, to Argentina. So Ar Argentina, well, Argentina uh, in the post-war period, um, they uh, suffered. two almost incredible recessions, certainly great recessions. Uh, they are actually qualified to be called depressions because uh, the drop every time was more than 20% in, in terms of GDP per working age person. So this, this picture is on large scale, so, uh, so uh, it, a straight line corresponds to a constant growth rate. Um, and and I, I'm sure students can read this. 
the fact that uh, log dropped from 1.5 in 1980 to under 1.3 in uh, 1990 tells us that the drop was more than 20 percent. Um, this was also not uncommon in some other Latin American countries a and uh, because it covered a whole decade. It was, this decade was called the lost decade by these, uh, by these countries. So uh, Carlos Sarsaga, who's at the Dallas Fed, and I, we, we were asked to, to um, contribute to a volume about Great Depression including the one in the U.S. in the 30s, some other countries in the 30s, but also some of the Latin American ones that we did. We, we looked at what, what we could say about this period. But we did have the data beyond 1990. So, so we, we decided to plug numbers for what the measurements of Z would be, or would, would have been for Argentina, into a standard model. Not much more complicated than the one I showed you. Uh, that that's all, all we needed for that purpose. And then uh, we asked, what does a model predict about what's going to happen? So the previous picture is there we're dividing basically by the population. This, this picture looks uh, slightly different, but it's, but it's in terms of the total volume of the picture, the great, the great uh, the depression doesn't look quite as dramatic when you look at the total GDP. So, so these are the data for GDP. What does the model say should have happened in light of, of, this, of the sequence of Z? Well, it should have grown uh, uh, quite a bit faster. Uh, well, let's skip that. Capital input turns out to be critical. Um, here's what the model says that the economy should have, if it had been a well-functioning economy, it should have ended up with substantially more uh, capital. One way to think about this exercise is, uh, it, it's like you apply a thermometer. I get to mention thermometer twice in this talk. It's like you apply, apply a thermometer um, what, what the model uh, suggests is what should have happened in this economy if Argentina was a well-functioning economy. But the fact that the actual economy deviated so much suggests something was wrong. Argentina was ill. The thermometer showed not 37 degrees, but 40 degrees. But now, now you ask, well, what kind of disease is that? Well, Carlos and I had a name for it, the time inconsistency disease. So uh, the best explanation for what happened in Argentina is because of past hyperinflations, the, one, the ones I've shown you weren't the only one. Argentina has had a history of that kind of outcome. Uh, past hyperinflations, in such circumstances, people lose all their, all their pensions, the value of bonds drop to zero, uh, People remember. And so uh, Argentina just didn't have the confidence am among investors to generate the kind of uh, capital building, capital formation that would have been natural in light of its potential productivity. Um, the, uh, the, the end outcome can be, I mean, this is a very depressing picture. The, it shows the capital stock for a working age person. It had a peak in 83, 82 actually, and then hasn't recovered beyond that since. With uh, predictable implications about 
uh, low real wages, uh, large poverty level or very un un unequal uh, uh, incomes in, in the nation, etc. Very sad case. Um, oh, let's see, do I have time for the... Okay. So the, this, this, uh, this example I actually talked about last week. Last year. Um, so this is GDP per capita in uh, four countries, UK, France, Germany, and Austria. They look quite similar. Uh, here in the same picture, we have uh, added Spain, Italy, and Greece. Actually, Italy isn't doing too badly, but uh, certainly Spain and Greece are way below these, this other collection of countries. Uh, here I have Ireland, and they're in a ballpark with Spain and, uh, and Greece. So in 1990, Ireland did, decided to do something to make future tax policy certain. They said, if you uh, invest, whether you're a foreign com company or uh, domestic, if you invest in uh, our country, these will be the tax rates, the capital income, capital tax rates, 1992, 93, 94, all the way to 2009. And evidently this was credible because what was the effect? Within 10 years, Ireland had overtaken all these other four countries in the picture. Um, now, it's true, it's true they stumbled in 2008 because of lax regulation of their banking system. So, so not everything uh, the Irish government did were, was that wise, but Ireland still looks to be in pretty good shape. A and they seem to be uh, sticking to their guns in, ter in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, environment for, for, uh, for investment. But, but these countries are sort of interesting. After Greece, the problems in Greece, these are the four countries that were often mentioned as a potential problem countries in the future. Ireland was included because uh, to they decided to rescue the, the banks. They were in trouble at incredible cost to the taxpayer. Um, so their, their debt to GDP ratio shot up dramatically. That's one reason they were me uh, measured in the same breath with Spain, Italy, and, and Portugal as potential problem countries. PFP, that's, that's a measure, measurement of Z in the production function that I showed you. Uh, these are shocking pictures because they basically say that in these three countries, uh, Spain, Italy, and Portugal, the technology levels stop growing completely. And economies cannot, uh, cannot grow sustainably with that growth in Z. Uh, if we translate that into uh, labor productivity, that is total output divided by hour of work, you get fairly similar, similar pictures. So, so when I discovered that, I, I, I used to draw the following conclusion. Um, these, these three of these countries especially, Spain, Italy, and Portugal, uh, they would complain, well, we can't do anything because we're members of the Euro and uh, that ties our hands and uh, well, um, these problems started before these countries became members of Europe. So I used to conclude that this talk about the Euro was just a red herring. Um, not everyone may know what red herring means, so I brought the definition. Red herring, something that 
uh, misleads or distracts from a relevant or important issue. Actually, the uh, dictionary had something unimportant that is used to stop people from noticing or thinking about something important. Okay, so I, I used to think this was a red herring um, until I got started on a research project with an economist at the Dallas Fed, not Carlos Alsaga, but this is Enrique Martinez Garcia. Um, so it, this idea kept nagging us that, well, may, could it be that uh, it's not really a red herring? Um, and the idea was, certainly it, it was announced or became known that these countries would become members of the Eurozone uh, a few years in the future. And as soon as that became known, that, as the data back up, uh, the country premium of these countries in the interest rates, their interest rates, their real interest rates dropped dramatically. And then, um, then we worked out what was likely to happen in the face of a big drop in, in interest rates. And it turns out the answer is a serious misallocation of resources, of uh, factor inputs in production. The model economy we, we use is one where we divide the, economy, the economies into tradable and non-tradable goods. Tradable, you uh, show non-tradable, their housing sector, for example, large part of the government uh, sector. Uh, and this is, this is an astounding picture. It's, they start off being about half and half in 1980. By 2007, uh, trade, tradables are down to 35% uh, and non-tradables 65%. Uh, if we do an experiment where we imagine that what would have happened if the weights on those two sectors had remained constant at 50% over time, uh, then P of P would have been substantially higher in, in the aggregate economy, in the economy as a whole. Uh, this picture gives, us, gives two lessons. One is, suppose you use a model uh, and you assume that the interest, real interest rates would not have declined. Y you calculate what would have happened under that circumstance, and, and then you compare with what actually happened. Uh, this picture suggests that the interest rate plays a role, but the other message in this picture, this is the traded sector. Notice it goes, for example, from about 100 to 200 in uh, about 25 years, a growth rate of uh, just under 3%. If we do the same picture for non-traded sector, students know uh, to keep their eyes pe peeled on the vertical axis. And it's, uh, well, the previous one went from uh, under 100 to well over 200. This, this goes here from 1980 to uh, over the same time period, only from 100 to 116, that's a growth rate of a third of a percent per year, in contrast with almost 3%. Um, so the conclusion we draw, it, and thi this is work in progress. We're, we're writing, uh, we're in the process of writing that paper, a and uh, the most recent thing we've done in the past month is check that this, this is for Spain. The same story applies to Portugal and Italy. So, so we're, uh, we think we'll come up with, it, uh, with uh, an account uh, of this thematic event. Um, you may ask, well, what about Ireland? Well, Ireland, labor productivity can be compared. 
the TFP index, their indices, it's hard to compare across countries, but lay output per worker, you, you can actually compare. These are on log scale, uh, so the straight lines are the average from 1960 to 1990, then extended to the present. Same for all uh, four pictures. Um, and, and they're in logs. Now, if you, if you work out, Ireland admittedly has slowed down a little bit in, in the past few years, but if you calculate what output per cup per work, hour work is in Ireland compared to these countries, Turns out the answer is about 40 to 50 percent height. So that suggests to me that Ireland is likely to be in pretty good shape in the long run. Um, so, so let me just end by saying that, well, uh, all, macro, all macroeconomic models now use this uh, this uh, approach to modeling, to be, be explicit about, about decision problems of households, businesses, uh, and so on. Uh, also, what, you, what's what I call neo-Keynesian models, they, they use the same approach. It's just that they focus on different things. They focus more on, on various rigidities that may affect what happens in, in, the, in the economy. But, but really nothing different in, in, the, in the modeling approach. The only place where the, the system of equation approach still remains is in uh, undergraduate tech. So uh, um, smaller versions of it is sometimes called the ISLM model. Uh, and they're still in uh, text. And my conjecture is that the reason for that is uh, doing dynamic dynamics on paper is very diff different. Um, so so, so uh, the system of equation approach, admittedly, is a is a uh, uh, pe pedagogical device, but I think it's a very misleading one, and I I, I prefer to. Uh, take the computer in to use. So, so this is what my students here are in the middle of. They, they uh, get to work with a, a, a model economy that has been programmed up for them. Oh, and then uh, and they can learn from that. It produces impulse responses. Suppose there's a shock to the economy. How will that uh, transmit to, to consumption and investment and so on? And they com can compare with, uh, they can calculate uh, statistics and compare with, uh, with uh, similar statistics in the data. Uh, so my guess is that this is going to be the future because there's no way around it. All the interesting phenomena in macroeconomics are dynamic. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Oh, I forgot about allowing time for questions, but I'm happy to take them. How do you incorporate Moore's law into your household model? Moore's law. Well, so so that sounds like a very interesting question. It's not one that I have addressed myself. But, uh, but uh, clearly, it, it's something that that law must have played a role in Z. Uh, now, so I showed you a very, very, the, the most stripped down version of this kind of model as possible. But the, the, depending on the question you're addressing, you'll have different elements in the model. For some questions, it makes sense to make the production function more detailed. You, you can, uh, you can have uh, structures, I mean the buildings separately and machines separately. You can have uh, skilled and unskilled workers, maybe the interaction between uh, 
them is, is different, skilled and unskilled is different, the, you know, all kinds of in interactions. And also, if you ask that question, I've, presumably I would start by thinking, how can I get deeper into how the Z works? A and uh, what, is it, what is it that's really driving it? I don't have any personal ex expertise in doing so, uh, but um, I, I do agree that that would be uh, that, that would be an interesting question if one can get a handle on it. And a good point about how, you know, CMU is also known for a very, uh, you know, very famous machine learning department. You will see in this machine learning playing a role in economic science. Um. Well, it, it, it plays a role in, in other fields, but but in, in so you're asking about uh, economic science, and and that's hard for me to see at this point. I mean, the um, economic science is in some sense more transparent. I mean, uh, you, you you start with the question, and then you. you you, as a researcher, decide which are the features of the economy that are important to take into account in asking this question. It's partly a subjective uh, decision. It's partly also motivated by, at least that's how I view it, by what you can hope to observe or measure. Um, now, uh, but, but it's important to be explicit about it because other, other researchers may have a different opinion and then they, they can point, well, I don't, either I don't think this is very important or, it, or he, he left out of the model economy this thing that I think is really important and then you put it in and, s and you, you see if you, if, you, if you get a different answer. Uh, I mentioned an example because when Prescott and I first uh, used our models of immortal, in, immortal uh, economy, immortal consumer economies where everyone is alike, that was one of the first things for skeptics, skeptics to point to and say, well, that's, that's, that's got to be... Uh, they've left out something very important. And it took Victor Rios, in fact, to show that, well, for that question, it doesn't make a difference whether you uh, take into account life cycle behavior or, uh, or not. Uh, so um, uh, maybe it's a sign that the, the fact that I don't think at this point of machine learning is a particular, particularly critical issue, issue may be a reflection of the notion that, well, because economics, economic science, to, to my mind, got to fairly late start. And, and so uh, we, we have made a pretty good headway, but uh, there are still ways to go. Thank you, doctor, for your uh, interesting presentation. A uh, question if you take into your account uh, in your models the impact of natural resources in a country, so the discovery of natural resources or, and the impact and the dynamics of uh, natural resources. Uh, I, I have two papers in, in which the oil price play, plays a significant role. And if you want to look them up, they're, um, they're both with uh, co-authored with Bill Gavin, who, uh, uh, who at the time was at the St. Louis Fed. And that's an interest, it's, it's an interesting field because when uh, oil prices uh, started really moving around a lot, it looked like it had a big, big effect on the economy. 
and then we're uh, 20 or 30 years later, and then the oil prices can still move a lot, but it doesn't seem to have quite the same uh, kick to the economy, either positively or negatively. And that, that's an example of an of interesting feature that led us to, um, to uh, embark on, on that sort of study. I think it's a, a very interesting field. Um, I should be interested because I'm a Norwegian and, and in Norway oil is almost as important a, as it is in Qatar. I guess I ran out of time. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't uh, go any further on that.